All right, I'd like to introduce the next panel. Um, Dr. David Lowenberg, uh, Dr. Peter Axelrod, uh, Dr. Samir Mehta, Dr. Michael Serkin, and Dr. Matthew Sullivan. Uh, Dr. Lowenberg is actually going to be uh, moderating the session. Um, Dr. Axelrod is actually an infectious disease specialist, and uh, the rest of the panel are orthopedic trauma surgeons. And we're going to be talking about the infected fracture, what to do and when to do it. Uh, Dr. Lowenberg, uh, are you able to share your screen? I'm going to stop sharing. And if there's any technical, I'm try now. if there's any technical issues, I do have your slides. Um, can you see my slide? Let's see, share desktop. Does that work? Yep. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay, um, thank you for inviting me. We'll get started now. Um, my practice is basically the treatment of osteomyelitis is 70% um, of what I do, really. That and non-unions is, is all I do. So um, I'm gonna give you my perspective while we do this as a panel. So to jump right into it, I'm gonna show you a case. Um, not sure how to is it here. There. This is basically a 32 year old female. I'm going to ask the panel what they think. This is her story. She was found in a riverbed unconscious with an open femur fracture, head injury, a bunch of other things. And she was taken to a community hospital and they washed out her femur. And I think they initially tried to fix it with something. And in the end, she was eventually, because of chronic infection, put in a cast and left in a spica cast. And eventually it was taken off and eventually the fracture healed. But she was on chronic suppressive antibiotics. She grew anything you can imagine in a riverbed, take your choice. And uh, there was aspergillus other organisms. It, it really doesn't matter, actually. And she was sent to me for care. And this is what she looks like. She had draining sinus tracts at her thigh right there. What you see is what you get. No hidden agenda here. And I'm going to take you through what we did, and then the questions will start. There's her MRR with the fluid collection there at that malunion site. She got resected, long resection. Um, something, this is an old case, so things are a little different for me now, but the idea is the same. After a wide resection, she underwent stabilization with a spanning fixator and then underwent a bone transport over a nail. And my starting question is, this person, antibiotics. And um, let's start with uh, Samir, are you on the call? I am. Great, give me your two cents. How long do you wanna give him antibiotics? Does she, me have, uh, does she have retained hardware? No, you saw what she has. That was it. Just that. She has an antibiotic, an antibiotic. mail. She has an external fixer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you had a wide resection. You have an antibiotic nail. Uh, you know, I suspect that people would suggest four or six weeks of IV or oral antibiotics. I'm not sure what the value of that is in a wide resection with local antibiotics, but uh, I would probably acquiesce and do four to six weeks of uh, either PO or anti okay. uh, or uh, IV antibiotics based on whatever the bug is. Okay. Mike, what would you do? So um, I probably, uh, for me, it's usually six weeks. Uh, and I do use IV. Uh, I, you know, I know you do some stuff okay. with much higher dose uh, oral. Um, but I do six weeks of IV and then I would re-biopsy and make sure that the culture is negative. But you're doing a transport, right? So I guess that's a little different because yeah. I would just start transporting um 
right away, but I would keep the antibiotics on and maybe before I bone grafted the docking site, just biopsy it to make sure there's no infection. Dr. Axelrod. Um, well, I guess the way I think about it is, you know, once you've resected the bone, what's the purpose of the antibiotic after that? Well, I guess, you know, there may be some infection still in the bed where the bone was sitting because, you know, there were bacteria touching it. And also, I guess the question is, you know, the bone above and below the resection, is there infection in it? Um, you know, the marrow certainly goes, you know, from the infected bone into the, the upper and lower bone. Um, you know, sometimes, at least for foot infections, what our podiatrists will do is they'll take a biopsy at the clean edge and a culture of the bone at the clean edge. And they say, well, if those are negative, um, you know, we probably just need to do a short amount of antibiotics. But in this case, since you're putting in, um, you know, bone grafts, even a little bit of, of uh, bacteria, even if you don't culture them at the, at the margin, could, you know, could really scare you. So I, I think the conservative thing to do would be to treat as though the residual bone is infected. And yeah, I, I agree, six weeks. Dr. Yeah. Sullivan? I think uh, six weeks is reasonable. The only issue that concern that I have, or one of the concerns I have that comes up with me from time to time um, is that sometimes IV drug users, and I'm not sure if this patient was or not, she has a history of cocaine, but sometimes IV drug users, uh, we have a, a difficult time. No, it's not. Forget that. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm, that's I'm just a referring to issue here. Okay. Hey, David. Yes. So uh, here. on the MRI, so. uh, on, it's Michael Serkin. On the MRI, um, yeah. was there any bone edema proximal and distal to the... Um, the malunion site, or was the MRI didn't show bone marrow edema proximal or distal? There wasn't, but that, that, that to me means <laughs> almost nothing, in all honesty. MRs overread things, is yeah, my experience. Absolutely. So I use them with caution. So here's the question I'm asking at your institution, I just want an answer. Pick the top one, the middle one, the lower one, I don't care. Let's start with you, Dr. Axelrod. How do you answer this question? Um, 50 to 74. Okay. okay. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Uh, somewhere, probably 75. I mean, it's either oral or IV, but they're getting antibiotics. Okay. Dr. Sullivan. 75 to 99. Okay. And uh, Samir. 75 to 99. Okay. Everywhere I've given these talks for a number of years, it's always the same answer. It's one of these. It, it shocks me. So here's the patient. She gets a real rod put in when the infection's under control, which is, I mean, a matter of a couple of weeks. She, uh, by the way, got IV antibiotic only while she was in the hospital. So I think it was two or three days, maybe, total of IV antibiotic. And these patients sometimes get a week of some PO, sometimes, sometimes nothing. Actually, more often than not, nothing. She went through a bone transport, the nails locked, grafted the docking site. There it is. And she gets a non union at the docking site, which is not uncommon with this technique when we used to do it. So, tough problem or easy problem now, Mike? If it's culture negative, it's an easier problem. I can't tell your alignment, though, um, from these. I can help you later with that. It's good. Um, here it is. On, she got an exchange want... rod. That was good. If you, if you don't have an infection Pardon me? anymore, you can just treat the, the non-union, however you want to treat the non-union. Exactly. That's it. That's in a nutshell, that is 100% correct. So she got an exchange rotting. She healed with equal limb lengths and resolution of her osteo, returned to full activities, never had IV antibiotic outside the hospital or any extended oral course of any kind. There's your 12 year follow up. 
she's back at work. She was a nice lady. She actually got on with her life. She wasn't a screw up. She was actually an accountant. And I followed her. I called her at 19 years. These patients, it's hard to get them back. Still doing fine, no problems, no recurrent infection. And uh, I think this is a little bit of my point. I, uh, we don't give IV antibiotics, only rarely. And I'm gonna show you why coming up. Um, you gotta, when you treat these people, but let's go over my mistakes in this first. I didn't define the stage of the osteo, did I? I never defined it here. That's a mistake. I didn't define the host type well, did I? And actually, looking back, I last talked to her a couple of years ago. It's probably 21, 22 years ago I did that. Um, I also resected more then than I do now. I'm much more cautious because of proper staging. And to understand this and to treat these, you have to really understand the micro. We have a basic science lab for this, where we study the sessile phase of growth and persister cell lines. And it's really uh, been quite enlightening, to be honest. You got to remember IV antibiotics, they don't touch a sessile phase of growth. They're just creating a Pavlovian response to keep the bacteria quiet in the biofilm. The Cyrene Mater classification, and I urge you all to use this. If you're going to treat infection and you don't stage it, you're going to compromise your results. And this was a type four. I needed to define that properly first. I also needed to just um, stage, I mean, type her. And she was a 2B host. There was 2A host. There was local problems. But why the classification system matters is it dictates your treatment. And the biggest mistake I see referred into me is people treating osteo, and many of them are people you know well, you've heard of them, they're quite well known, and they get these disastrous results because they never staged the osteo they were treating. And they think an int intramedullary antibiotic rod treats everything, which is the farthest thing from the truth. It's really for a stage one or to stabilize, and that's it. So this is the one of the only staging systems I know of that actually helps dictate treatment. And it's very important. And this one slide kind of sums it up. We're going to refer back to this as we go through this. The host um, staging too, I think is really important because it helps you dictate treatment. In fact, for us, the condition of the host is far more important than the type of bacteria in a wound or that we treat. So let's go on to another case and go through this. Here's a lady, 58 years old. She had a closed distal tibia and fibula fracture. It was reported as a closed injury. She was treated with a closed IM rotting and distal fibular plating. No hidden agenda here, straightforward. Here she is after. It was done, I don't know, Oregon or Washington somewhere. This is her. No problems, right? Does anyone have any criticism or complaint? Anyone? No. I, I would agree. Here's the problem, though. Everyone told her she's doing great, but she was in terrible pain. Normal person. Could barely walk two blocks at best. Constant pain. Her leg was swollen. Stayed that way. Here she is three years later. She's doctor shopping. She's hurting a lot. It's real. Um, she was told she was crazy by some, this, that, and the other. All accusations, no, nothing solid. There was no, no evidence of any psychiatric illness. Now she's eight years out. Her life has been completely altered. She can't walk. She's kind of wheelchair bound, can walk short distances and in agony. Does anyone see anything strange here? on the x-rays. It's subtle, to be fair. I had a wise teacher, he's still alive, Jim Johnston. And we used to share an office at UCSF and he uh, told me every year you get better at reading x-rays. And I think he's true. I still study him and uh, there's some subtle changes here. You notice the kind of periosteal reaction, it's a bit widened there in the shaft. 
It's subtle, nothing horrible, but there's something there. So what do you want to do? Uh, Mike, jump in. What do you think? I don't know a right answer for this, but jump in. You know, I, an MRI is not going to be of any help, I don't think, because of the nail in place. CT scan may help you. It may show some sequestrum. Um, I don't think your inflammatory markers are going to be high because I don't think she has a big systemic response. Um, the, you know, the, the periosteal reaction, I'd have to look, oh, you know, that's certainly, it, it's probably easier to see even how subtle it is in retrospect after following it for eight years and, and, and knowing what the thing is, but it could just be fracture healing as well. So I, you know, I, I know where you're going with it. I think David, I think I would, that was, this is somebody I pull a nail on. I ream them out, collect the reaming, send it for culture and see what happens and see what, and, and just, that would be my initial trial. Uh, I would probably get a CAT scan just um, because and a metabolic workup because I do. Uh, and the CAT scan may show something that you're not seeing around that area, um, like some sequestrum that is inside or involucrum inside of the callus that you don't see on the x-ray. Mike, so I have three that, questions. Completely Mike, I have three questions for you. Number one, there's in the chat room, uh, someone brought up, and I have my own opinions about this, the use of those inflammatory markers that, you, that, that uh, David has on his slide. I mean, ESR, CRP, are you putting a lot of value in those in this particular patient or at all? In this patient? No. I mean, to me, the... To, <sighs> If you don't have a systemic response, your SED rate and your CRP are negative, okay? And so we know that. Or if there's a big draining wound, your CRP can be negative as well because there can be, everything can be coming out, especially if it's been going on. I look at SED rate and CRP more as a following thing in markers after I do surgery where you get your response. I use CRP and post-op infections when I'm trying to decide if somebody have you know, a little bit of drainage from a wound. And I use those, but not for this case. This case it would only be to follow things uh, later. Okay, my second, my second yeah. question is, I have one more question. I have two more questions for Mike, David, sorry. You said you would pull the nail. Would you leave anything behind uh, in the canal? So, you know, it's, I, I guess some of this has to do with how sure of, uh, uh, well, do, I, do I think I'm treating an infection or not? So let's assume, and I'm like David, about 50% of my practice is, well, probably not as much as his, but maybe 25 to 50% of my practice is infection. So for me, I pull the nail. I would probably use a rhea because I could collect the reamings. If not, I would do it through a ventol. I would treat it like an intramedullary osteo. I would debride them and I would put behind some uh, resorbable antibiotic beads. Why? Because it's a freebie. Um, you're there and you don't have to go back for it. Uh, my third question is, and I'm sorry, David, CT scan with or without contrast to look for that involucrum or sequestrum or any of the other soft tissue stuff going on since MRI may not be as valuable. Uh, without, I don't think, I mean, the purpose of the CT with contrast is to look for rim enhancing lesions in abscesses. Uh, I have never been, a the, the I get CTs with, IV contrast because the radiologists insist on using them to me I don't really you know it doesn't help me so much and I don't think this patient's going to have an abscess so I don't think you need to give her IV contrast the bone is very well you could see the bone you can see the abscess even without IV contrast you don't you just don't get this rim enhancement that they like to talk about this is a chronic problem so I don't think that's the issue here Dr. Axelrod any uh, thoughts um, well, you know, obviously you're getting set to do a fairly big operation. Um, and you know, you want to make a big change for this woman. So to me, if you're clinically convinced enough that she needs surgery, no matter what these things show, then I don't think you really need them. On the other hand, if you kind of say, well, I think this light, this could be an infection, but I don't feel strongly enough that I know for sure I want to go to surgery. Then I would probably do um, C, D, and E, um, not relying on any one, but kind of saying it's sort of like the predom predominance of the evidence that 
you know, if the CT is completely normal and the ALKFAS is low and the sed rate and CRP are perfect and you don't really think it's an infection, then I think it could help you. But if you're thinking, I just got to go in there, then these things I don't think are necessary. Okay, good. I, I, I completely agree with you. Let me go over a few points that were just gone, that were referred to for the uh, audience. Inflammatory indices, what's the bottom line on that? It's actually pretty clear this is not something debatable. It's George and I um, looked at a, a good thousand cases of osteo between the two of us. Remember, George had data on 3,500 cases of osteo he treated up till his death. And the bottom line is positive inflammatory indices for chronic osteo are under 50%. It's somewhere in the 40% range or positive. 50% of our cases were culture negative, in fact. Um, Mike, there's, I rarely disagree with you, but I'm gonna disagree with you on one thing here, and that's resorbable antibiotic beads of any sort. I um, don't think they should be used. And the reason is, um, I don't mind them in an acute infection maybe, but in a chronic infection, you cannot get the concentration you need of a thousand fold in MIC to have any effect on the sessile phase of growth. That is the bottom line. And that's my complaint against them. If you've had good results with it, that's good. But certainly you can't mix those um, substances, any of them, and get polymerization with the high dose antibiotic you need that you can get out of PMMA when you use it. So that's my beef against the absorbables. When they can fix that, I'll be 100% on board, but there's not one on the market I know of where you can do that yet. Also, they use um, an antibiotic most of the time, but the absorbables that are on the market with pre-made, it's an amino glycoside, which God, George stopped using, we, him and I both stopped using amino glycosides probably 15 years ago at least. Um, what you said about the CT though, I completely agree with. I don't, you don't need contrast for this ever. It's just without contrast is perfect. Let's go and see what happens. The docs got another doctor. She came in with this, a bone scan. It showed it was hot there. Um, so, this is actually, I didn't fault the other docs for this at all. I never get nuclear med scans except for one thing. The only way they help me ever is if it's a stage one osteo. That's the only thing they can be useful for. And uh, you'll see that's what this was. So the treating surgeon saw that, so he decided to dynamize it. He did get inflammatory indices. Dynamize the rod, as you guess, nothing happened. Here she is. So he eight dynamized and a half years the rod later, because and she he thought the bone scan was indicative of a non-union uh, of um, weak bone or something. I, I didn't get it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I can't answer that question. I didn't get it. Huh. So, what do you want to do now? Well, everyone knows where we're going, right? We're going to E. And I find CTs like you do, Mike, extraordinarily helpful. If I had to pick one test, my favorite test, just across the board, it's a CT scan. It's extremely helpful. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I, so you, you made see anything there on the CT? Yeah, you made reference to the MRI not helping where because it's an overread before. And I agree with you, David. Um, the time an MRI is helpful for me is when it's negative, because then I know there's no osteo anywhere else. It's so I use it and I know I, I just use it as an adjunct to treatment. But if there's a nail in place, it's absolutely worthless. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the MR, I, I actually agree with you on that point. It's good for jump lesions. Yeah. So anyone, uh, Dr. Sullivan, you see anything on the CT? Anything impress you or? Yeah, I think there, there's a significant amount of periosteal reaction there, which clearly suggests that this has been going on for a long time. I think it makes sense at this point, um, as it has to, to pull this nail out um, and, and, and go from there. And I think that, that re reaming her canal and, um, makes a lot of sense, too, in this patient, especially if we can get some good culture data. Yeah, Samir, you agree? 
totally agree. I would take everything out. I would ream the canal with, I would do what Mike said. I agree with Mike. <laughs> Reasonable, yeah. So, called it for what it was, took the rod out, reamed it up, put a high dose local antibiotic delivery system and at the same stage. If you think it's osteo, you gotta treat it like osteo. One of the four tenets of osteo treatment is dead space management. So I think if you go that route, it's in your best interest to fill the dead space with something. Um, for me, type ones, stage ones, get an antibiotic nail. That's really primarily the only thing I use that for most of the time. So here she is. This was back in, what was it, January of 2013. And P-acne was what grew. I know you don't call it that anymore, but um, anyway, she got no IV antibiotics except for the two days in the hospital. And uh, what's amazing with these people, the intramedullary osteos I see, the stage ones, they're always either due to iatrogenic due to surgery or to the rare hematogenous spread. And actually I've seen it most frequently of that in people with cancer, immunosuppressed patients really. But, um, the, the thing about P acne only occurring, you know, in certain parts of the body, I've seen it all over the body. It could happen anywhere. And what was remarkable when you do these people, it's virtually just about every patient that I've seen that's had a stage one osteo is when you get the inciting thing out the rod out and get the infection under control within days, that pain is gone in these people. It's rather remarkable how quick they react. So here she is, leave the Ryan for a while. Six weeks later, we remove them give or take, you know, six, seven, eight weeks. Here's her seven months later. Um, I talked to her, that final follow-up was about six years post-op. She stayed asymptomatic, went on to a normal life after that and did well. So very straightforward problem, all related to the index surgery for a fracture. And uh, you can really make these people better. We're gonna go on to another concept here that I think is really important that we're kind of beating around the bush on. I want you just to look at this. This isn't due to trauma, but it illustrates a really interesting point about bone infections, which I think will help every orthopedic traumatologist. This is a lady who I saw when she was 79. At 15, she developed hematogenous osteo of her left distal femur, kind of on the late side, but I I've seen this. Um, I've seen people in their 20s for some reason get weird hematogenous osteo. It's usually women. I don't know why. It's just observational. An, an excisional debridement back then. Um, and I think it was in the 40s, actually. And she was one of the first people in the US, by her description at least, to receive penicillin on a compassionate use basis. And she did really well until seven weeks before she saw me. And she just developed a flu. And a week later, she develops swelling and pain of her left thigh and kind of hurt more and this, that, and the other. And then after another week, developed malaise. And then a week after that, a draining sinus. And here's her x-rays. And uh, I, I don't know the reason for this. Dr. Axelrod, you might be able to help on this. On people that have had chronic osteos that are in check and doing well, living with the biofilm host in this really harmonious state, I've seen viral infections for some reason tip them over the edge into having instability among the host and biofilm. And I'd appreciate any of the panel's knowledge on this or advice. It's, it's observational on my, point, my part, but I've seen it oh, at least a dozen times. Yeah, David, I've seen it at least a dozen. I don't know about a dozen, maybe half a dozen. And they're always a recurrence of the old infection. It's never a new infection. How do we know that? Because they grow out bugs that don't exist anymore, right? They grow out pan-sensitive staph or something like that, or something that, or you have cultures from going back. And I guess Peter would be, you know, the question I've always been told or the answer I've always come up with this is there's something that just knocks their host immune system down, which a virus can do or anything can do and age can do. And it's always in an elder, elder, older person and their infections come back and we treat them. And that's the only thing I can come up with, if, if, if that makes sense, is that their host, it, it, like you said, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a good world. They're just, their host and the, and the um, bacteria are in, you know, 
nobody's hurting each other. And then all of a sudden the host's immune system gets knocked down from whatever. And all of a sudden the infection comes out. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree completely. I, I think there's some subtle change in the immune system. I think that's more likely than a change in the bacteria after all these years. Um, and I've seen a few patients like this and it always amazes me. And what I try to do is in, in teaching my fellows um, who don't understand the chronicity of bone infections, they kind of think like everything's solved in you know, a few weeks. And I try to tell them, you know, yes, it's nice the person's doing okay, but bone infections are different. They're different than any other kind of infection in, in this way. Thank you. Yes, it's a different feel. Absolutely. Well, I want to outline, this was a, you have to stage it, right? Stage or in this, um, from the OKUs is actually an incorrect statement. It was never called by George a type, it was a stage. But their stage or type, this is written here, threes. And uh, for me, type threes, stage threes are the most common. And I can show you a breakdown of that. So remember, the staging system dictates treatment. This is important. So here's her thigh. We're going to excise that sinus tract because it's in line with the incision. In all honesty, for the last oh, 10, 8, 10 years, I only excise sinus tracts if they're in line or at the site of the um, incision for care. My reason is really quite simple. It hit me like a two by four on the side of the head about 10 years ago. The sinus tract's your friend. It's your barometer. It tells you what's going on in there. So if the sinus tract were somewhere else, I would not have touched this. I leave it because it's telling me how the treatment's going. If the sinus tract goes away by itself, which is what usually happens, you've got this under control. So I use them as an aid, not as an enemy. But in her, it was in line with the incision, had to go, so took it out. And the key is the surgery here. It's that simple. You have to ellipse it out without a stress riser. If I've taken out and I put in an antibiotic bridge plate, I've done that probably oh, a good 150 times easily, maybe 200. Um, been doing that for about at least 20 years. You can see in there though, the sequestrum, you could actually see it on x-ray to be fair. That's the size of the cut. Here, here's the sequestrum. It's just asking to come out. You clean up everything else while you're there. There's the antibiotic bridge plate. And she got antibiotic beads too. And again, you got to fill the dead space. That's what you're seeing there, the antibiotic beads to fill the dead space with an antibiotic bridge plate. And she cleaned right up, did fine, went back in, took the plate out. And the, the one mistake I made in this case, and I, I could have killed myself, I did not keep the bacteria. I wanted to genetically sequence it. So a, a staff from the uh, 40s would have been really very interesting. And that was a mistake on my part. Um, she got better. David, quick. Why you, why, Dave, why, why do you go back? Why do you go back and take out the hardware? If it's healed and it's clean and you've, you've, you believe you've cleared the infection, why take her to an, why take her back for another surgery? To get the beads out because they're, they're a source of, I, I feel strongly they're a source of potential further infection because they lose their antibiotic potency very quickly by about six to eight weeks. So it, you're, you're, not, you're not doing it, 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 if, it for whatever reason, I can't imagine, let's say people use something dissolvable in, in the canal and you had that plate there, would you have gone in to take the plate out if there was no beads left behind? No, Okay. I'm with you. That's why I use resorbable. Completely I, agree. I, I understand David's point, uh, but this is now an, uh, an acute infection, right? That has come back, but may, I don't know. I use absorb. So for me, this would be some type of fixation to, for stability. And I would put resorbable beads in the canal as well to manage dead space. And then I probably wouldn't come back. But Mike, no, I, I disagree with you on this being know, now defined as an acute infection. I know. You, it's I a know, chronic I know you infection. Okay. No, I, I just, um, we haven't, Chronic infections can change to a planktonic phase, a huge form, they become acute again. 
but you kind of don't you think you got to deal with the chronic the chronic infection in there yeah, i do that by well. getting rid of the dead bone and getting into breeding i do an adequate debridement i i understand everything you're saying clinically what i have done seems to work for me um Maybe I don't uh -huh. need any antibiotics. Maybe I just do such a good debridement. Look, I, I, but I know, I mean, I look at Kate's stuff. There's always bacteria behind. I'm not sure. I haven't seen, and, and maybe I just don't know the literature well enough on exactly, you know, I have a lot of unanswered questions about cement and antibiotics and how real, how long it's really effective uh, once a coating forms around it or once it's in the body. Uh, I do know resorbable beads. Maybe it's not super high dose, but it does leave some antibiotics behind. We don't know. There's a lot of unanswered questions in my mind about this. And it's just, I've just done it. I, mean, I haven't done it as many times as you, but I have a pretty good track record of curing, you know, curing infections uh, without people coming back. And maybe it's just that I've done it long enough that I do a good enough to breed Mont and everything else is superfluous. If I had to put money down something, you're a good surgeon and I bet your debridements are perfect. And I think that's the most important part of all this. Yeah, and, and I don't do a lot of, I don't do a lot of transport. I, you know, I am more of a, of a mescalate type person for like that first case, I probably wouldn't have done a big enough as resection. I would have put a nail in it with cement around it and come back and bone grafted it later. So I, I'm not a, I'm not a transport guy. It's just not, I can do them when I need to, um, but I don't do them that often. And maybe it's just the breeding enough. And, you know, it's the, you know, everyone else it's, you know, it's, oh, it's just an I and D that's the thing I scrub in for more than I scrub in for fixation of fractures. Sometimes to me, the debris months, the I'm entire operation. With you. I think so too. I couldn't agree more. And, and your case, results are good. I, I get in it. In this case, um, you know, you didn't show a CT. I know you had a CT and I agree with you. If you look at the x-ray, you could see the involucrum, you could see sequestrum, you can even see the sinus in the bone. But for me, this is the key. This, these are the cases that MRI is invaluable in my hands because for me, I want to look if there's osteomyelitis. I, I know it's let me rephrase it. I want to see if there's bone marrow edema above this. If there's bone marrow edema above this, okay, I have no proof that that's infection, but I do know there's edema and I do think the MRI overcalls it. But what I would do in addition to what you did, if the MRI was positive above this, is, is I would have reamed the canal just to try to get any other bacteria that were more proximal in the femur I would have reamed the canal. If it's if that's this is my <clears throat> a negative MRI is extremely helpful to me in the treatment and the positives are I probably over treat. But if I see don't see any bone marrow edema, then I know I don't have to ream the canal. Proximal. Um that that's reasonable. I I don't believe that is necessary most of the times. So I try to preserve blood supply. I think your approach is, is sound. Um, I want to keep moving. How long antibiotics? Uh, just each person blurt out a, a one word, uh, two words. How many weeks? IV antibiotics. Dr. Axelrod. Um, I might do eight to 12. Okay. Mike? Uh. I let my ID people make that decision. I work very closely with them in their osteomyelitis IDs. They would probably go 12 weeks on this. Okay. Dr. Sullivan? Six weeks of IV antibiotics. Uh, Samir? Yeah, six weeks of IV antibiotics and probably some discussion with that hardware retained about whether we should orally suppress them for any period of time after that, likely another six weeks. Well, I work closely with my ID docs too. In fact, um, my institution, there are three ID docs that are allowed to see these patients as a dictum from the, uh, our chief of ID, who's a really fantastic ID physician. I get accused by uh, my kids as I, 
they're all grown, but I talk to my ID docs more frequently. Than I talk to my own kids. Um, every patient that we see, we see in conjunction. An ID doc is with me physically in clinic, seeing these patients, every one, each visit. So we're very uh, tied at the hip, to be honest. And they're my biggest proponents for what we do. IV antibiotics, what's their role in chronic osteo? What's the bottom line in the literature? Well, the only study that had been done was one by George. And it was a retrospective prospective study of people that got less than two weeks of IV antibiotics. That was the prospective arm with the retrospective arm of six weeks or more of IV antibiotics. One surgeon doing all the cases, there were over 400 patients in each treatment arm when George went over his data. And what was the end result? No difference in outcome at all. And um, no journal would publish this, is the sad truth. Just like uh, it took him forever to get his classification system published. And this was considered too con controversial. Um, before he died, I, I promised him I'd get it published. I thought I had it done, and, but I didn't have all the data then. Unfortunately, Doreen died six months later, and I was never able to get the computer with the rest of the data on it. So I let him down in that regard. But I do feel something had to come in the literature to look at this. So we published it in, I think, uh, 2019 in, in injury. And that's, let me go back. This was my ID doc at the time, Gina Suss. She's a head of musculoskeletal ID at the Mayo now. We looked at a set of uh, patients, 164 cases. You had to exclude some. Patients with chronic coxie, I see now about two a year. I think I have two under treatment right now. I had to exclude those because they're always on something for their more disseminated disease. 17 patients, we do this thing called a knee pseudofusion that were in that time period. Seven cases I, I did have poor follow-up on. And the, the pairs and quads, I can't count in because they're always on antibiotic at times for their UTIs and other infections they get. So it clouded the waters. We wanted pure, clear chronic osteos. This is the stage of them. You can see the, the great majority of osteos really, it was the same when George looked at his or stage threes and second most common are stage fours. Host type. And to me, the host is the most important thing. And type two locals are the most common type for me. I think um, George had the same data. Site, no surprise. So seven patients out of the 127 got an IV placed and left the hospital with an IV. So they got over two days of IV antibiotic. Um, the rest didn't. Many received a little oral for seven to 10 days, something homeopathic, I think. And that was it. Well, how'd these patients do? There were two recurrences at the two year mark. Both were a mistake by me. It was 100% my fault. I staged them wrong. One was a stage four that I didn't want to face the music on in the femur. And he was not a candidate for transport or masculine or anything. He should have just gone to an AK and he eventually did. And I tried to treat him as a type three, stage three. I mean. um, but he was a type three host. And there was one patient who I just misstaged him. He was a four and I staged him as a three. That one we cured, took him back, treated him like a four and he's cured. And he's got, I think, five year follow up on that. No recurrence. And I had one other follow-up questionably three years out, and I'm not sure it was real. Um, the pathology and cultures were negative. Cultures can be negative, but I did read to breed them, so I'm counting it as a failure. That's it. So in this late, this lady took the beads out, used an allograft and bone marrow aspirate combo for her, and just use that to fill dead space on the final, replaced a clean plate, no antibiotic coating on it. So we had her under control and cured of her osteo. Let it mature. There's a month post-op, the auto alum mixture, two months following grafting, five months. And at this point she wasn't coming back. So I contacted her. Um, I actually, she came back the one and a half year mark. My last follow-up with her was probably 
two years after that. She's three and a half years, four years. I tried to get hold of her about a year or two ago and um, she passed away actually, but no recurrence in the rest of her lifetime. So key point. Now, I think this slide kind of sums up some of the key things you have to think about of acute infection versus a sessile phase of growth infection with biofilm. These are real important um, bits of information. Before we go on to another case, I want to ask uh, first, um, Saki, how much time do I have left so I can determine where we go? Yeah, I cut into your time quite a bit. Um, I would say we should probably wrap up at 12.35. Sure. I'm sorry, my time, uh, 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, I got it. Well, then I'm gonna jump way ahead. So hey, David, anyway, what happens ahead, when systemic David, antibodies? David, David, can I ask you a question while you jump ahead? Let me finish the slide, then we'll do okay. that while I start jumping okay. then. Um, so what, what I think happens when you have a biofilm and you give antibiotic, all you're doing is teaching the biofilm how to behave. And then maybe that's all you want to do, that's fine. But I, I kind of feel it's a Pavlovian response. It's like ringing the bell. The bell is the antibiotic and it's teaching your biofilm, the dog, to stop shedding planktonic cells. That's not a bad thing. That might be a treatment in the future. There's talk about using short chain RNAs to talk with, um, biofilms and two labs around the world have done that and just put them permanently to sleep so that one day we stop using IV antibiotics, antibiotics in general. It's not a bad idea, but I think that's really what we're doing when we have an established biofilm and we give antibiotics. We're certainly not killing the bacteria. They're, they're surviving. They have many defense mechanisms. So I'm going to skip this and try to jump way ahead. So ask a question now, and I'm just going to yeah, well, jump you're to skipping, the last case. For so you or the panel, uh, while you're skipping, for you or the panel, is anybody doing anything with retaining implants where they are worried about biofilm formation? And I bring this up because as a segue to what the arthroplasty folks are doing in terms of sonication and intraoperative sort of cleaning of implants. You know, is anybody doing anything in situations where they need to retain implants for whatever reason in the setting of an infection, maybe an acute infection, but are worried about biofilm on the implant? Well, I, I mean, in all honesty, I think the most promising thing out there right now is phage therapy for that. And uh, my ex ID doc, Gina Sa, has a whole program going on at the Mayo for that with pretty good results. The biofilm disruptors that have come up and gone have been a problem. There are compounds, they're proteinaceous that can just um, digest biofilm. The problem is each one that's been found in nature is horribly immunogenic. Dr. Axelrod, do you have any uh, insight into that? Um, no, I haven't really worked with that, I'm sorry. It's, I, I think those are two interesting things. The sonication to try to grab bugs, uh, for me, I, my algorithm is kind of straightforward. What determines my treatment is, um, is it a prokaryote? Is it a fungus? Or is it mycobacterial? And from that, my ID docs have watched it and they're, they're with me on this, that from that, our algorithm is decided upon and our cure rate doesn't change for us to get in detail of exactly what bug that is from there. It's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, I'm gonna jump into the last case so we can end on time. I think this has a lot of discussion points. Here's a 38 year old. Um, I owe my livelihood like probably all you do to one thing, the motorcycle. It's been very good to me over the last 32 years in practice. Um, he underwent a washout, closure of a wound. It was, it, I don't know why I have closure. It was an open fracture. Then he developed multiple sinus tracts. It was draining for quite a long time. And at six months, his uh, orthopedic traumatologist started saying, well, maybe something's wrong here. These sinus tracts, maybe they're not normal. So um, on June 26, 2013, he was referred to see George, who was in San Diego at the time. Only problem was... Uh, Unfortunately, George passed away on the 24th from his cancer. And that, that, the reason I know is I'm, his wife asked me to write his obituary. Um, so she sent him to me and I saw this gentleman a month later. Here's his x-rays. 
he's eight months out, nine, I don't know, something from the injury. He's got a big rod in, he's got all these breaks, no hidden agenda. But what's more important, and this drives me crazy when the residents show me the x-rays before the exam, this is what's important, looking at his leg. So this is really a morel lesion of the leg too. It's kind of a mess, right? So you got this leg that looks like that. He has a sensate foot. Every one of these little things here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, there's one over there, eight, there's at least six, eight, I don't know, nine sinus tracks on his leg. So it's not looking so good. He has a normal ankle motion, good knee motion, takes no pain medicines, is a trucker, just wants to get back to work, has a family, totally normal foot, except for swelling. So, you know, I think here are your options. What do you want to do? Chime in, uh, uh, Matt, what do you want to do? Yeah, I think that all those little uh, comminuted fragments are dead and those are sources of infection. Those need to come out. I have a concern about the, um, that large segmental piece as well. Uh, which, which also potentially it looked more sclerotic than the surrounding proximal and distal segments. So I'm, I'm concerned that that's dead. Although to go in there and take all that out, it's going to require a large soft tissue flap. Um, so if, if uh, I think that's certainly a consideration that if he's a host that could tolerate a large flap, um, then everything can come out and, and he could potentially get a, a, a ring fixator bone transport um, and, and uh, a free flap at the same time. Okay. Mike. Yeah, it's hard for me to know what's dead and not dead. Um, I want to see a CT scan like yeah. I do on every one of these so I can see really what's sclerotic, what's not. Is there sequestrum? The biggest question is, is can you put an incision on his leg? Uh, we have great plastic surgeons that could flap anybody, uh, sometimes much to my dismay. Um, when I think a person, I think you got to talk to him about needing about an amputation. I don't think that uh, a trucker who's a, who wants to work, who wants to just work, he may be okay with an amputation because that's what's going to get him back to work the fastest in one operation. And I think that's a real conversation to have with the patient. Um, I know I rarely do it. I mean, I have the conversation, but I rarely push for that as an operation for people because it feels like it's a, you know, I'm a, it's a loss. But if he can take an operation on his leg other than something intramedullary, then I would make the incision, take out what's dead. I'd put an uh, I'd ream his canal, take out his nail, put an antibiotic rod on, and then put a big block spacer in and, and see what he needs after that. Okay. Samir? Yeah, I, I'm on the same page as Mike. This is a conversation with this patient in terms of how many surgeries does he or she want. Um, and I don't look at amputation as a failure. I look at it as another surgical option. Look, you can have a free flap, you can have a mascale, you can have a vascularized free fibula, you can have a ring fixator, you can have a lengthening nail, you can have an antibiotic nail. I mean, we can go through the, the plethora of options, but what do you, Mr. Trucker man, what do you want to do, right? And based on what you want to do, I'm happy to do it, right? Recognizing there's no go backs from the amputation, so we can put the limb back on. Um, and I will tell you in 15 years, I don't think I have a patient who's regretted getting an amputation in the sense that a lot of them have already been through a lot of this and they're ready for that, right? They made the decision as opposed to me telling them. Um, for this guy, I, I think it's, again, I, I follow the same path as Mike. I want to find out what's alive, what's dead. I'm also blessed to have plastic surgeons, orthoplastic surgeons like Scott Levin here who can flap anything. And so this guy would also fall into that category of maybe a vascularized free fibula for that big segment, segmental defect that I think I'll be left behind with if he has a fibula that I can use. Great, yeah. And you know, you know how close I am to Dr. Levin, Samir, so <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the real deal. He's, he's the best, no question. Uh, Dr. Axelrod, any sage advice? Um. Well, like many of you, um, I've seen amputations make things better. Um, I had one woman that had, as, as a teenager, um, had a, a very large prosthesis put in her leg for a bone cancer, as because she didn't. They gave her that option instead of an amputation, and then after that, just years and years of antibiotics and pain medicine, and her opiates if you gave them to a horse would probably kill them. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that she looked so normal on that, those doses of opiates. 
And then finally, finally, she had uh, a pretty high above the knee amputation. Um, and she's so much better. She's on no pain medicine. She does anything she wants to do. But having said that, um, I have the disadvantage of not being a surgeon to know exactly what the options are. Um, you know, if this person is willing and able to be non-ambulatory for however long you guys tell me has to be, I guess if you take out as much bone as you can and um, clean up, you know, whatever you can around viable bone. Um, and I know you, you know, you feel that the surgery is more important than the antibiotics and you might very well be quite right. Um, but however long antibiotics you wanna give, long, short, whatever. Um, and then once you think the infection is cured, trying to put him back together, if he's willing to do that, I, I think that's an okay thing to try. Okay. Well, the reason amputation's at the top of the list, that was intentional when I made the slide. George used to say, and I learned this from him, if you do amputation as the first thing you offer the patient and proceed with that, that is not a failure. But if you try a bunch of things and a year later amputate, that is a failure of treatment. So here's what happened to this patient. It's called climbing the non-union ladder. These are the four premises of the treatment of all bone infections, period, no matter what they come from. The steps have to be the same and the same every time. Climbing the non-union ladder. Got a thorough debridement, beads were needed, and anything left was because it was bleeding and alive. And there was more bone than I thought there would be that was alive. So after the thing, this is what it looked like. So we go to the next stage. Let's get rid of some of the non-union and defect. And got a bone transport after the proximal beads were removed. There he is after the frame's removed. Now we have no draining wounds, infection eradicated. These pieces that I thought would be dead were bleeding. I left them. I can't tell sometimes. So the only way I can tell for sure is to open it up and take a look. Because still, bang for your buck, that's the best information. I agree with you, Mike, that CT is extraordinarily helpful, but it can misread things too. But if you see bleeding bone, it's probably real. So there's his leg right at this point, and his skin looks much better. Everything does look healthier. So we have living bone, a healthier soft tissue envelope with a segmental non-infected non-union. Climb the ladder. For me, when I have at least half of the tibia remaining, uh, a vascularized free fibula is gold. It works very well. I don't use them for the lower extremity, if there's not other bone there, because the failure rate, both in the Bunky Clinic, where I worked for years with, and um, at UCSF prior, had a very high failure rate of about um, one in three would bend or break. So, but if it's supporting other things, it's worked very nicely. So here's him a month later, three months later, six months later, he's back at work. This is what his soft tissue looks like now. It gets better when you get infection out. This here, a little key point when you do a free fibula, you've got to take a skin pedicle with it because the skin is perfused through the fibula and um, it tells you if the fibula is alive because the skin will die if the fibula dies. It's your best barometer of the bone health when you do the um, free bone and tissue transfer. Here's 10 months post uh, the free fibula. He's walking, he's working. Here's him clinically. Oh, how much antibiotic did he get? I can answer that. He got it for two days each time he was in the hospital. That was it, nothing else. Here's in three years, what his leg looks like. He's working full time, doing everything. The biggest problem I have with people like this is they don't want to come back because they're sick of doctors. So I have to literally chase them down. So here's his leg at three year mark. 
everything looks good. Again, he's active doing everything. Six years later, I call, you know, I had to track him down. He's, he's about six years out now from the free fibula part. And uh, he got a new motorcycle. He's working full time, fine, no recurrent infection or anything. And why does this matter to me so much about the use of antibiotics? The CDC and the um, London School of Tropical Medicine and Epidemiology both predict but by the year 2050, the leading cause of death in the world will be death due to antimicrobial resistant infections. This is a scary thought. That's less than 30 years from now. Head of cancer, diabetes, all these other things. We got to do a better job here. In the U.S. currently, we're consuming 51 ton powdered antibiotic. 70% is in poultry, livestock, and uh, fisheries, but 30% is in humans. We're losing this fight. And if that doesn't scare you, I just want you to look at this video here and listen. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands. And at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally, the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right, it's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. After about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. Suck, so that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, and to the whole panel. That was um, that was a really good discussion. Complex stuff, um, but you know we all have to deal with infections. I think a lot of us don't really know how to deal with them properly. Um, so thank you, and uh, to the rest of our panel for all your expertise. Great discussion. Uh, I mentioned in the chat uh, that I did a couple of interviews. One with uh, Dr. Namdari on proximal humerus fractures in the elderly. And I did a podcast interview with Dr. Lowenberg last week. If any of you, uh, you know, we'll have this session recorded and posted um, as a video, but uh, if you wanna check a short podcast interview, it might help answer some of your questions that you all have. So thank you very much.